Hi, welcome along to another video. Links to the articles are in the information section of this video. Later on we're going to get into this new scientist geoengineering article from the 22nd of September 2012. But first we'll go through some of the latest news and some information. Starting off with the importance of technology. It's from June the 27th, the role of cloud seeding technology in weather modification. Good information for people that are new to the subject. Has a nice picture in it. Handy article to pass on to people who are just starting out learning about this. In America, from the Weather Modification Association, indications of downwind cloud seeding effects in Utah. This is for a report from the North American Weather Consultants from 2019. Also from the Weather Modification Association website. North Carolina, feasibility design study for cloud seeding program in the Yadkin River Basin, North Carolina. Also from North American Weather Consultants, Incorporated. Also from 2019 on the Weather Modification Association website, California. Results from a winter cloud seeding feasibility study conducted for the Lopez Lake and Salinas Reservoir drainage basins in southern San Luis Obispo County, California. Over to South Africa on the 29th of June this year. From News 24, more South African airports to open as aviation industry gradually resume flights. As we get into who's allowed to start working again, all aerial work to conduct the following will be permitted from the 1st of July. Cloud spraying, seeding and dusting and spraying, seeding or dusting other than for agricultural purposes and clouds. So cloud seeding is permitted again in South Africa from the 1st of July. Over to Indonesia from June the 29th as well. In Indonesia will respect international law as Singapore investigates forest fires causing haze pollution. Now you'll be well aware of the forest fires there and also the weather modification being done as a way of uh, dealing with the fires. What's interesting about this article is it's quite law based and haze related. It's about Indonesia pledging to respect international law. And it's about the forest fires that enshrouded the region in toxic haze. Right at the very end, on the second to last paragraph, the only other subject or sidestep from the article is this paragraph. Indonesia has been carrying out cloud seeding operations to induce rain in regions prone to forest fires until the dry season ends in September. So it's all about respecting law and international law and also about their weather modification activities. Just a coincidence though, obviously. A mashable Southeast Asia. Brace yourselves, Malaysia and Singapore. The haze is coming. Firefighters have also begun cloud seeding. These operations would last until the end of September. So Indonesian weather modification until the end of September. In the Econo Times, Andrew Chung of 1955 Capital speaks at Climate Tech Webcast hosted by GreenBiz.com. This report from July the 1st on May the 28th, 2020, GreenBiz hosted a webcast, This is Climate Tech, which is about empowering corporations, governments and individuals to make a positive impact on the climate. Such solutions include geoengineering, and solar radiation management. Back over to the Indonesia side of things in the Borneo Post, central Kalimantan declares emergency as forest fires spread. This is from July the 2nd. Firefighters have started cloud seeding, a technique that uses chemicals to induce rain with operations set to last until the end of the dry season in September. And the website resources, innovative ideas and engaging stories in environmental economics shared some links from uh, this site before seems to be covering the geoengineering subject quite a lot solar radiation management as a climate intervention an extended q a from the rff live webinar and this is very much worth a read uh, the people who are being interviewed are from harvard same place as david keith so no need to say any more there if we take a couple of snippets from the interview SRM may have unintended consequences. These risks 
may be serious and they may merit significant scientific investigation. Serious risks also arise due to climate change. We recognise that some research investigations will require experiments and those experiments will not be without risk. However, we believe that the risks of not, not experimenting and therefore not learning about SRM are more consequential. So that's kind of a clever game, isn't it? Like they should be able to carry out risky things because there's a risk from something else. Okay. It's a very interesting article to read because they very, do very much talk about the consequences of geoengineering, SRM, solar radiation management. But at the same time, they come with the other hand of, if you don't do it, we won't know. So it's a very clever argument. Over to the Rolling Stone. Does geoengineering have a place in our policy toolbox? The radical solution tucked into the House Democrats' new climate plan. If you're in America and elsewhere, it's worth looking at this. The Atmospheric Climate Intervention Research Act, HR 5519, is introduced by Representative Jerry McNerney, Democrat, California. A 550-page document, and right at the end, as I say, buried on page 535 of the plan, is what amounts to a call for a federal geoengineering research program and the act will provide reporting oversight for climate intervention experiments. Atmospheric climate intervention, also known as geoengineering, is the Frankenstein of climate crisis solutions. We would all agree with that. At the end of the day, if it's being done, it's better it's regulated and people get to know about it than what's been going on for the last 20, 30 years where it's just done. It's not the solution. It helps. So this report, House Select Co Committee on the Climate Crisis, 547 pages, and as the Rolling Stone article says, it is there on the right page, and it's all about it. It's getting into more detail on the New Scientist edition of September 2012, Geoengineering. We have plans to call the planet. Will they work? This has done the rounds in the anti-geoengineering world for a few years so you might be aware of it but never actually got to read the article or know any details about the article so you might already think new scientist it's not going to be good it's going to be very harvard style pro geoengineering we shouldn't do it but we sh we might need to one day so let, let's play around let's experiment so it's actually not like that there's quite a few pieces where they are definitely talking about the consequences of doing this stuff and it's taken quite seriously. I'll read you a few bits from it but to wrap it up it is a good article. In the introduction they talk about different types of geoengineering the sort of ridiculous ones like some more um, logical than others. They do speak about space parasols etc. So we just pick up on this bit but the first test is potency. In 2008, Lenton and Nem Vauhan of the University of East Anglia in Norwich, UK, combined various model results with their own calculations to assess the potential cooling power of a couple of dozen proposals. They found that many schemes would make little difference. Two schemes stand out as being both highly potent and relatively feasible. And this is where the article sort of splits uh, from getting rid of the sort of silly ideas, leaving two ideas that are relatively feasible and highly potent. Both involve some form of sunshade. One idea is to whiten marine clouds, sp specifically the low flat stratus clouds that cover a large swathe of sky. They propose doing this by ships, and absolutely no mention of aeroplanes spraying. It's very much ship focused. Think about the sea only, don't think about the sky. Cloud whitening has its upsides, such as not involving any hazardous chemicals, but cloud nucleation is not well understood, so it might not work as well as proponents suggest. And cooling only the oceans could disrupt local climate. 
A study published this year found that seeding clouds over the Pacific might alter rainfall patterns in a similar way to the highly disruptive La Nina weather phenomenon, for instance. So as much as what they're saying it's a possibility, they're also saying that it can be very disruptive. The second option, the other leading contender, is an old one. Fill the atmosphere with a haze of fine sulfuric particles. In fact, we are doing this already. Sulfur dioxide pollution forms fine droplets of sulfuric acid that already reflect an estimated 0.4 watts per square meter. And with regard to spraying sulfur, unfortunately our sulfur spray may barely slow the sea's advance. Sulfur droplets do not linger in polar regions as long as they do in the tropics, making them less effective polar coolants. So even if aerosol injection brought the average global temperature back down to that of the 1800s, the poles would not be as cold as they were and the ice caps would keep melting. And then it also picks up on sunshades could also have disastrous regional effects according to climate models if they disrupted the monsoons they could bring permanent famine to billions or say you change the circulation patterns that feed moisture to, to the amazon rainforest says tim palmer of the university of oxford you might turn the amazon to desert in 2010 Miles Allen of the University of Oxford and his colleagues looked at the effect of varying amounts of sunscreen in the stratosphere using a detailed climate model. They found that there is no solution that works for everyone. An amount of aerosol that would take China close to comfortable pre-industrial temperature and rainfall might cool India too far, far too much. There is also the information that many of you know about if you if start this it can't be stopped this makes any sunshade highly risky if it turned out to have some terrible consequence and we suddenly stopped replenishing sulfates or whitening clouds the planet would warm very rapidly over the next few years so there you go once you start you can't stop that's the general gist of the article the rest of the article goes into um co2 carbon capture also the political side of it where really it's politicians that need to sort this out we'll leave that there for this time thanks for watching listening thanks for subscribing if you comment thank you take care goodbye see you next time